गुड इवनिंग प्रवीण सर सर माइक प्रवीण सर योर माइक इज म्यूट सर हेलो या सर नाउ ऑडिबल सर गुड इवनिंग नीतिश सर गुड इवनिंग सर गुड इवनिंग गुड इवनिंग हेलो हेलो सर गुड इवनिंग सर गुड इवनिंग गुड इवनिंग गुड इवनिंग सर मैं रिक्वेस्ट टू on uh, all the uh, videos i think if many of the videos are off sir so that we can interact more with dr previn sir so shall we start the introductory part after that uh, we will proceed with our, our meeting yeah yes sir yeah good, good evening uh, all the doctors on the onset i would like to welcome all the respected dignitaries to the on this uh, at board on the role of mr in the art pillar and we have an expert who would be moderating the sessions and who require no introduction actually dr pribin kumar sharma he is the senior interventional cardiologist at sdmh hospitals jaipur and also i would like to request all the uh, delegates to keep their videos on for the fruitful discussion on the uh, mr at uh, thank you uh, again for joining the valuable time and looking forward for the enriching session with this small brief i would like to end our session dr pribin kumar sharma sir The slides will be shared by you. Hello. Yeah. Are you able to see my screen? Yeah. Yes, yes, sir. It is visible, sir. Okay. Thank you, Dharam. Actually, I am Dr. Praveen Sharma. I am an interventional cardiologist at uh, Gurulam Ji Hospital. So today we are going to talk about a topic called uh, the role of this uh, mineral particle receptor antagonist, where we should use and how to how how we can utilize this uh, drug in the patients for a heart failure management. And uh, the second topic will be the hyperkalemic hyperkalemic hyperkalemia related issues. that is a very notorious side effect with this uh, drug called um, mineral particle receptor antagonist that does it really concern the patients for this uh, routine general physician practice and to create awareness about this physicians on this uh, role of uh, mineral particle receptor antagonists so we talk about this heart failure uh, global epidemiology so the prevalence of heart failure across worldwide is around 2.6 uh, the road people was having heart failure there was around 1 to 2% of the total adult population in the developed countries was having the heart failure and then as we know this prevalence of heart failure increases with days it was around more than 10% of the total patients so more than 70 years of age was having heart failure so if we talk about india well, again the incidence of heart failure is around 1% so there was around 1 crore people will be there with this heart failure in india so the annual incidence is around 1.5 to 1.8 million new cases per year and if you talk about this mortalities then the again this 0.1 to 0.16 million individual per year will uh, was dying from this uh, disease called heart failure so if you talk about uh, our uh, expert panelist since how many percentage of patients heart failure patients that that approach to you in and why it two or three or four and how many how many heart failure patients that will go under under undiagnosed in india at an early stage so what are the uh, what are the factors which can uh, this uh, 
which can uh, make these heart failure patients undiagnosed and what are the diagnostic and the prognostic tools which we can use in such patients to diagnose a heart failure. So if you talk about this uh, heart failure decision pathway that has been used by this uh, uh, 2021 update according to the American College of Cardiology guidelines, they have shown, uh, they have said that uh, the patients whose uh, serum potassium level is uh, more than five or somebody got a EGFR less than 30 or creatinine clearance more than 2.5 or creatinine more than two in women, so in such patients, we should not use uh, this uh, uh, mineral cortical receptor antagonist. So generally, how many of you uh, people use this uh, potassium levels, creatinine levels, or EGFR levels to start this uh, mineral corticoids? And how, many, and how long we should uh, do these tests in every follow of the patients? Anybody? Hello. Hello. Ah, sir. So, how many of the? Uh, sir, sir, basically, basically, very routine practice to get a creatinine level and potassium level to start the uh, MRA because the very high yeah. chance of hyperkalemia after starting the therapy after within uh, one to two months. So, uh, we have to monitor it every three months the, the potassium level if we patient taking MRA. Yeah, definitely, because in, in heart failure patients, uh, the incidence of uh, raised creatinine or uh, hyperkalemia uh, is very notorious because such patients will the low cardiac output patients and then then these patients will be having some, some card cardio renal syn uh, this syndrome also. So definitely we should use uh, this uh, potassium and creatinine levels that it checked for every patient was we are planning to start this uh, menalocortic receptor antagonist, like whether it's epilirinone or whether it's a, a spinal electron. So if you talk about this uh, recent guidelines about this uh, mineral cortical receptor antagonist, that was a uh, European Society of Cardiology 2021 guidelines. So again, this they have shown the patient got a heart failure with a reduced index infection. So the definition of heart failure with reduced index infection is less than 40%. So in such patients, mineral cortical receptor antagonist has been a class one recommendation to reduce the risk of heart failure hospitalization in the death. And if you talk about this, the other group called the mildly reduced ejection fraction means uh, between 40 to 50 percent of the patient uh, of uh, ejection fraction in such patients. Again, this mineral cortical receptor antagonist also. It's again a class 2B uh, recommendation to reduce the risk of heart failure hospitalization and the death in such patients. So, if you talk about the latest uh, this uh, diagram which has been published in just recently. So the, uh, generally, uh, these four pillars of uh, heart failure management, like ACE inhibitors or RNAs and beta blockers and this uh, mineral cortical receptor antagonist. And uh, nowadays, we are commonly using this SGL2 inhibitors. So these all four pillars of uh, heart failure management. So somebody got acute heart failure admitting and after stabilizing the patient with the IV diuretics, and when we are switching over to the other heart failure medications, then I think we should start with the first with the adding this agile inhibitors, and then we should start using uh, adding this beta blockers. And if the somebody is tolerating this both the drugs, then we can uh, this add this mineral cortical receptor antagonist or a ACE inhibitors or a RNA. So one, if the patient got getting stabilized uh, with all these four groups plus uh, diuretics. And uh, then we can continue these drugs uh, with the uh, four drugs for the management of heart failure with reduced cell infection. But if the patient is not getting stabilized with this, all the four drugs and diuretics, then we can increase the dose of uh, diuretics to avoid this uh, volume overload. And in some selected patients, like somebody got a uh, sinus rhythm with LBB with the more than 150 milliseconds duration of uh, QRS, then we can advise these patients uh, to, to go for whether it's a uh, uh, this CRT P or CRT D, and uh, this again a class one recommendation in the patients who got a LBB with the sinusism with more than 150 milli milliseconds QRS duration. 
and if the duration is between 130 to 150 for LVVB, and if it's if the duration is more than 150 in the patients, got a non LVVB. In such patients, again, CRTP and uh, CRTD uh, is a class 2A recommendation. And if you talk about this ICD, automated implant with cardioverter defibrillator, then again, if the etiology is ischemic for heart failure, then it's again class one recommendation. If the, but if the etiology is non-ischemic, then again, it's a class 2A recommendation. Earlier, it was class 2B recommendation in terms of non-ischemic etiologies. But in the late, latest guidelines, they are saying this again, it become a class 2A recommendation to put a ICD in the patients who got a non-ischemic etiologies. And if you talk about the other arrhythmias like atrial fibrillation, so all the patients was in, in heart failure with atrial fibrillation, these patients anyway will need a anticoagulations. So for the either to uh, inc increase this uh, AF to sinus rhythm, then we can use either desoxin or pulmonary vein isolations. And somebody got a coronary artery disease, then these patients should be offered cabbage in, because the patient was a CAD with LV dysfunction. The only thing which improves mortality in such patients is CABC. And somebody got anemia in terms of iron deficiency, uh -huh. these patients again should receive some IV iron in terms of ferric, uh, ferric carboxy maltose. These also supportive therapy should be considered in the patients who got a uh, heart failure. So if it's somebody got a aortic stenosis, such patients should be offered as a, as a surgical aortic valve replacements or some transcutaneous aortic valve replacements. Somebody got a MR, then these patients can either go for a MV repair or some, uh, some MV replacements. And somebody got a heart rate more than 70 with beta blocker, even after tolerating the maximum dose of beta blocker, somebody is not achieving a heart rate of less than 70, then we should start using evabradine in such patients. For black patients, again, this isolating combination, we should consider and if you talk about this, uh, somebody is not tolerating ACE inhibitors or RNAs, then we should use ARBs in such patients. For some selected patients with uh, some advanced heart failure, which, which are not getting uh, managed with this uh, present existing uh, anti-heart failure medications, then these patients can be considered for this heart failure, heart, heart transplantations or some this bridge to transplant or bridge to some minimal uh, this mechanical circulatory support systems and uh, these patients also can go for some long long term mechanical circulatory support system or some wrist transplant so all these patients should receive a quality exercise rehabilitation program and these patients should be managed as a multi professional disease management so if you talk about uh, in such patients how many percent of the patients do you use this uh, mineral record receptor management for this heart failure, and how many of you consider starting mineral cortical receptor antagonist in the patients who got a heart failure with ACE inhibitors or ARVs and beta block? I think most of the patients require this uh, MRA in initial stage of therapy when we are given diuretic and we need the MRA. After that, Patient is still present. Definitely, if we stop the torsamide or loop diuretic, we should continue with the MRA. So most of the patients go on with the MRA therapy of heart failure. I agree with uh, Dr. Soman because uh, all the patients are being given ACE inhibitors along with the loop diuretic, and uh, this uh, MRA also acts as potassium sparing. So it is a must in each and every patient, along with ACE inhibitors, diuretics, and MR. So we have to maintain the potassium levels also to reduce the chances of uh, developing the arrhythmias. Yeah, definitely. definitely. I, also agree. Hello. Hello. I also agree with uh, this, uh, this doctor. Uh, I'm also using uh, diuretic along with ACE inhibitors, along with the particular receptor antagonist. For almost in every, each and every patient, uh, uh, just for uh, the purpose, uh, we have to use uh, we have to just investigate and be cautious for about the, the hyperkalemic problem according to this mineral particle receptor. Uh, other than that, uh, yes, uh, those patients which are uh, tolerating this, so they uh, give the wonderful result. Also. 
by the Okay, thank you, Dr. Rupesh. So top, we'll go to the next section. So what is the call, this uh, mechanism called this aldosterone escaping congestive artery patients? So it was generally we use uh, MRI as, as early as possible because on the uh, top of the treatment like ACE inhibitors, ARVs and beta blockers, generally we should use, try to use this uh, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist uh, just before the discharge for the patient who got acute uh, decompensative heart failure. So, because in such patients, uh, a acute fall will be there in the aldosterone levels in response to this administration of ACE inhibitors, the level of uh, aldosterone will again rise and then it, it will indeed return to the baseline in almost all patients, the phenomenon called aldosterone escape. So, after having acute fall in aldosterone levels in response to ACE inhibitor, <clears throat> this aldosterone level again will rise and then it will again returns to the baseline and then again it will cause some fluid retention and will promote heart failure. So in such patients, to uh, decrease this progressive escape of aldosterone, we should uh, try to start this mineral aquatic receptor antagonist as early as possible and preferably before discharging the patient uh, when the patient got hospitalized and we should try to start uh, this uh, mineral aquatic receptor antagonist. And if you talk about this um, uh, aplirinone versus uh, mineral, uh, this uh, spinalolactone, so which uh, drug is better in terms of mineral corticoid receptor antagonism? So if you talk about this eco criteria, again, definitely there was some uh, much more improvement was there with this uh, in terms of systolic functions, with the eco in terms of uh, and uh, this uh, and systolic dimensions and, and systolic volumes and some in terms of ejection fraction. So there were definitely more improvement was there with this epilinone group in comparing this uh, spinal lepton group. So in how many of the patients you should use epilinone versus uh, spinal lepton? So which, in which population you prefer this epilinone and which population you prefer this uh, spinal lepton? Any specific uh, patient profile Generally, uh, our friends uh, use to select uh, whether we use, should use a, a plenone or a spinal account. So I would like to comment on this thing. Uh, in uh, rural patients, the patient compliance is better with cheaper drugs. So I would like to uh, describe a paranoid account for rural patients. Urban patients, they afford a plenone better. The patient okay. compliance is of uh, much importance in this regard. Okay. So I think one more point uh, I would like to elaborate here, the, uh, this incidence of gynecomastia. Na? So definitely around 20% of the patient will, uh, with spinal mm -hmm. lactone will come back with some problem with the gynecomastia. And if you talk about the incidence of gynecomastia or aplirinone, it's around only 5% of the patients. So this is also a very important uh, factor we should consider in using the spinal lactone versus aplirinone. Otherwise, at the incidence of hyperkalemia is also lesser with this epilinon in compared to this uh, spinal lepton. Anyway, definitely this is a point you have carried out. This uh, the most important factor in Indian setting is always a cost plus uh, uh, this uh, affordability plus uh, this uh, availability of the drug also should be there in, uh, in the rural areas. So anyway, this spinal lepton is much more uh, easily available and widely available in compared to this uh, epilinon. You talk about this, in, and how many of the patients we should use, uh, whether it's a spinal lactone or epilinone dose adjustment. So, in all the patients who got an EGFR more than 50, or uh, then we should use a uh, spinal lactone as uh, 25 milligram per day dosing. And if the EGFR is uh, between 30 to 50, then we should use a uh, 25 milligram every alternate day uh, as a spinal lactone dosing. If you talk about the dose of uh, epilinone. Again, this uh, almost double dosing of a uh, basic dose of spinal lepton, like EGFR more than 50, then we should use uh, 50 milligram of aplirinone. If the EGFR is uh, 30 to 50, 49, then we should use aplirinone 25 milligram per day. And we should uh, regularly use uh, this serum potassium levels to monitor this uh, spinal lepton and aplirinone dosing. So if the potassium level is less than four, then we can increase uh, this 25 milligram to 50 milligram. Per day, if the 
the patient already on uh, 25 mg every other day, then we can make it 25 mg daily dosing. And if you talk about this aplinone, aplinone we can go up from 50 to 100 mg and uh, from 25 to 50 mg. So if the uh, potassium level is between 4 to 5.4, then the same dose we can continue whatever the patient is taking earlier. And if we notice this uh, potassium level increases from 5.5 to 5.9, then we should uh, try to decrease the dose. Like somebody, somebody is on 50 mg of spinal leptone, then we can make it 25. Somebody is only on 25, then we can make it every alternate day. And somebody is only on every alternate day, then we should uh, interrupt the treatment and then the reassess the potassium level after one week. And in terms of aplinone, again, 100 to 50 milligram and aplinone from 50 to 25. Somebody is already on 25 milligram per day, then we should again interrupt the treatment and then reassess the potassium level after one week. And if the potassium level is six or more than six, then we should, uh, we should immediately stop this mineral narcotic receptor antagonist. We should uh, try to collect the potassium levels. And then after one week, the, once the potassium level comes back, then we can again uh, reintroduce some endocortical receptor antagonist at a lesser dose. Same thing with this aplinone. So we should not use uh, any endocortical receptor antagonist in the, if the patient's EGFR is less than 30. And uh, if we can correct the EGFR like uh, we, uh, with some hydration or just decreasing the dose of other loop diuretics, if the EGFR comes up, then only we should use uh, this endocortical receptor antagonist. So, if you talk about our clinical practice, how what is the preferred dose we should be? Uh, my friends are using, and what is the dose titration carried out in our clinical practice, and how we are going to do a dose titration in our day-to-day -day clinical practice. Most of the time, we start with. Most of the time, we start with 25 milligram uh, epilogue. And after that, uh, one to, six to eight weeks, after that, potassium recalculation, and if there is potassium is under control, we can dose titrate up to 15 milligram according to the legal status of this. Okay, I think one more clinical point from my clinical practice uh, and my uh, this uh, practical experience, I'm telling. If you're using uh, most of our friends are using uh, flusamide as a preferred loop diuretics, or most of the of my time uh, friends are using this uh, torsamide as a loop diuretics. Of course, the dose of uh, this mineral called receptor antagonist with loop diuretics, with whether it's a flusamide or whether it's a torsamide, is different. We should not use the same dose of mineral called receptor antagonist with the torsamide or flusamide. Because torsamide again. <coughs> will consume more potassium in, in comparison to this uh, furosemide. So if we, <laughs> like 40 milligram of uh, furosemide can tolerate the uh, 50 milligram of uh, spinal lockdown very easily. But if we try to use 20 milligram dorsamide with the 50 milligram of, of uh, this spinal lockdown, generally these patients will have much more incidence of uh, hyperkalemia and much more incidence of some uh, renal function worsening. So we should consider uh, this uh, this point also whether we are using torsamide or whether we are using uh, uh, this uh, furosemide as a uh, combining loop diuretics. So we should try to use lesser dose of uh, put, uh, this uh, spinal lepton or epilinone with the uh, torsamide in comparison to this uh, furosemide. I would like to add one more thing. Most of the patients, uh, almost all the patients are also receiving ACE inhibitors or ARBs in addition to this MRA. So that also add, add on to uh, incidences <laughs> of hyperkalemia. Definitely, you are correct, Dr. Uh, this, Nitesh. Uh, this role of ACE inhibitors and ARBs and specifically the newer drug called ARNs, that also will increase the incidence of hyperkalemia. So you should be very careful in selecting the right dose for uh, right patient. Okay, we'll go to next uh, this topic. All this, uh, what are the incidence of hyperkalemia in the patients was on this mineral aquatic receptor antagonist. So we talk about the, uh, all the trials which has been done with the spinal lepton or this epilinol like FSS trial, RAILS trial, emphasis HF trial, TOPCAT trial. 
these all, all are landmark trials which was there in uh, whether it's a reduced infection or whether it's a preserved infection. In such patients, the incidence of hyperkalemia was around 9.3%, but only out of this was 54% uh, was definitely related to this mineralocort receptor antagonist, but all other 46% of the patients, these were because of some ACE inhibitors or some diuretic related, some general issues was there. So if we uh, talk about uh, practically only 5% of the patients uh, was there, uh, was there with this mineralocort receptor related and uh, hyperkalemia. So if you talk about our clinical practice, so what percentage of heart failure patients on mineralocort receptor antagonists develop hyperkalemia and generally does they require a discontinuation of the treatment? And second question is if the, yes, and how, how many percent of the patients this, this will happen and how, how these patients we should manage? I think it all depends on the creatinine clearance of the patient. What is the level of creatinine? So if the creatinine is under, uh, under uh, the range, within the range, then there is no need to discontinue these MRIs. If the creatinine tends to rise, then only we should modify the drug doses. Yeah, uh, definitely Dr. Nitis, uh, this creatinine clearance and the creatinine level, we should always keep in our mind before uh, the starting this spinalactone and the incidence of hyperkalemia will also increase with the decreasing EGFR. I think one or two factors also will be there to increase the incidence of EGFR, like some acute uh, precipitation of heart failure, like sepsis, or that is uh, that also will lead to more incidence of hyperkalemia and ERF. That also can cause uh, increased incidence of hyperkalemia. And if the patient is not pursuing on the stable patients, I, I think practically in my experience, the incidence of hyperkalemia is uh, around one or two persons only. If you regularly monitor the potassium and creatinine levels in, in our patients, because these patients uh, generally very regularly comes up uh, with us uh, for a regular checkups, uh, whether with, in terms of eco, in terms of creatinine, in terms of potassium. So generally we see only one or two patients will develop some hyperkalemia uh, in such patients. And one more thing, most of our patients of CAD are also diabetic. So yeah, yeah. There is an element of diabetic nephropathy is always there. Yeah, definitely. That, is, the, that also will increase the incidence of hyperkalemia. Hmm. So, if you talk about this one again, more uh, point called how to start and where to start and when to start this uh, aplenorm in terms of the patients who got a heart failure because of some acute myocardial infarction, especially in anterior LMI, generally this most of the patient will go in heart failure and then and then in which patient we should start this. Uh, so this again, the landmark trial that has been done with this epilene on, that is called abscess trial. So that trial was also conducted only in the acute MI patients. In such patients, they started this epilene on. So in such group of the patients, there was around 31% of the patients show some mortality reduction in the patients got a heart failure because of some post-MI. Uh, if, if we are starting this epilinon within seven days or versus after seven days. So if, if we're starting early, definitely there was 31% reduction was there in this old all cause mortalities. And if we talk about this cardiovascular mortalities, and then again, 34% reduction was there. If we are starting these uh, epilinon in a patients who got acute MI within seven days, so if you talk about our clinical practice, again, how many of you generally start this mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist for the management of heart failure in the acute MI setting? I think we start it as early as possible. Along so generally, I think most of you, yeah. Once the patient got stabilized in terms of heart, in terms of blood pressure, in terms of heart rate, I think after starting antiplatelets and statins, I think you should start with the first with a beta blocker, I think. And uh, once the patient tolerates the beta blocker, then try to start with ACE inhibitors. I think somebody tolerating ACE inhibitors and beta blocker both well. Then only if the patient needs some diuretics, uh, then uh, you can straight away start with this. Uh, Loop diuretics plus this uh, mineral acort receptor antagonist combination.
So if you talk about this algorithm that has been you that we are using nowadays in the patients who got a heart failure with, with radiation infection, again the four pillars like ACE inhibitors or RNAs, beta blockers, mineral code receptor on antagonist in combination with loop diuretics, and again this SGLT inhibitors, whether it's a dafaclifosin or empagliflozin. These uh, all the four drugs we should uh, try to use in all the heart failure patients. Uh, if the patient is tolerating, I think the first drug we should, after st stabilizing the patient, is SLT inhibitors. If the, somebody is tolerating SLT inhibitors, then we can start with the beta blockers. And that if the patient is tolerating beta blocker, then we can start with the ACE inhibitors or the RNAs. And uh, in the end, you can just start with the inhaler cortical receptor antagonist. So after stabilizing the patient and after maximum uh, optimum medical therapies, we can consider the other points like the EF is less than one less than 35 percent, and the PVR stress is less than 130 milliseconds. In such patients, patient will definitely need some and uh, this AICD in non-ischemic etiologies. It's a class two A recommendation. And in terms of ischemic etiology, it's a class one recommendation. So if the patient's EF is less than 35 percent after uh, MI. Uh, so the patients will qualify for a ICD implantation. And if uh, EF is more than 35%, then we can continue with this medical therapies and try to use the maximal tolerated dose of this all the heart failure medications. And uh, in the third group, the EF, if the patient is in sinusism with the EF less than 35 and QR storage is more than 130 milliseconds, in such patients, we can go for uh, a combo device or whether it's a CRTD or whether it's a CRTP. If the duration is more than 150 milliseconds, then the indication is class one. And if the duration is less than, uh, if the duration is 130 to 149, then the recommendation is class 2A. So if you talk about our next question, like uh, at what stage of heart failure, Generally, this diuretics plus uh, MRAs, both are needed. And what is the preferred choice of therapy? Uh, like uh, whether just use a plain epilinone or generally use epilinone plus torsamide or generally use a spinal epilinone or spinal epilinone plus torsamide. The patient is having symptoms of heart failure, means feeling breathlessness, uh, having NYHA class 2, 3 or 4 symptoms. Then definitely uh, loop diuretics should be combined with uh, uh, MRA. There's no doubt about that. Loop diuretics is the most important agent in terms of symptom relief. Uh, so, and uh, this, uh, the potassium will definitely decrease with the use of loop diuretics. So to balance out those things, uh, we should uh, generally use this loop diuretics in combination with uh, uh, this MRAs. So I think if I talk about my clinical practice, this all the four heart failure drug medications, Nidamus of beta blocker, ACE inhibitors, do diuretics plus uh, this MRAs and uh, the SL, SL inhibitors. So I think 6 to 70 percent of the patients will be. Sir, voice is not audible. Repeat say your voice. Mic is mute. Yes. Sorry, sorry for interruption. Actually, my Wi-Fi went out because of some electricity problem. Actually. Yes. So, for Rajasthan, me lagra bizli ka to halat aise. So, ek ek ghante ki kardoti ka sir. Each and every place pe compulsory ho gaya. Sir, as to number of corona ke cases bhi Jaipur mein bahut zada aaye hain sir. Ah, bilkul bilkul. As to lagra corona vishport jaise word hum pehle use karte the na. 
वैसा ही हुआ आज भी जयपुर में था यार ऐसा लग रहा है कि कि मुझे ऐसा लगता है को देख लिया अप्रैल मई का महीने में जल... हाँ, वापस आएगा तो तो so, yes, तो तो का ऐसा कुछ भी मतलब पिछले एक, एक दो बार तो लगा था एक तो पेशेंट आए थे बट उसके बाद नहीं लगा की दोबारा आएगा हाँ जयपुर बट बट सीरियस केसेस है कोई भी नहीं मतलब लेस देन वन परसेंट आर गेटिंग सीरियस एक्चुअली ना यस तो दैट्स अ गुड थिंग अबाउट नाउ इस कोरोना एक्चुअली आफ्टर वैक्सीनेशन दैट सेवरिटी हैज जस्ट डेफिनेट कम डाउन ना यस सो इफ यू टॉक अबाउट थिंक व्हाट इज द प्रेफर्ड थेरेपी जनरली यूज एज अ डायरेटिक्स एप्लेनोन और एप्लेनोन प्लस टोरसामाइड और स्पाइनलेक्टोन और स्पाइनलेक्टोबसेस इंडिया in the, the peripheral populations when we, where where we are practicing and definitely now till now we are using more commonly torsamide plus spinelectron right. that's correct i think uh, the torsamide is widely available torsamide uh, this spinelectron combination is widely widely available so we can use this combination so just one more question for our all panel members like uh, in your clinical practice how many of you have uh, some uh, use this uh, menalocort receptor antagonist for indication other than heart failure sir resistant hypertension for uncontrolled hypertension resistant hypertension how many of patient is clinically you used well okay in the books they have written so how yes, many sir, we have clinically you? used uh, unless contraindication okay fine so generally you are using this okay. aldosterone antagonist alone or just with the loop diuretics combination no 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 loop diuretics alone alone you are used in so hypertension you have one counter diuretic alone loop diuretics no Al- alone you are using you are trying to predict after giving all the anti hypertensives which blood pressure is not being controlled then the last drug is being added is this mrx plain just aldosterone antagonist will use eh? electron yeah yeah Yeah, aldactone. Paranol. So, how many percent of the patient generally you will uh, use aldactone as an anti-hypertensive? Suppose you are having hundred patients as an uh, of BP patients, high hypertensive patients. So, how many percent is you will use uh, this aldosterone antagonist as an anti-hypertensive? Less than five percent of patients. Those and, who have and, resistant hypertension to multiple anti-hypertensive drugs, not being controlled by calcium channel blockers along with ARPs, along with beta blockers. then after giving all these class of drugs uh, if bp is not being controlled then to add uh, mr lastly so, so, so what is the percentage of uh, this uh, uh, is after adding this aldosterone antagonist uh, how many percent of the patient will getting good control of blood pressures 10% most of the <laughs> good response ha huh? because resistant hypertension is very hard to control very notorious problem. yeah Correct. I think uh, Dr. Mukesh is correct. Only ten percent of the patients will be able to And control one, this. One more thing, I would like to add: the, those patients who have resistant hypertension, they mostly have uh, some kidney problem, renal problem, underlying uh, CKD or something like that. So, in those patients, we cannot give this potassium therapy. Yeah, definitely, definitely. But uh, in if you talk about my clinical practice, I think out of thousand of uh, blood pressure patients, only one or two patients will be having like. other generally you do use uh, this potassium level as an evaluation for this hypertension do you generally uh, do this electrolyte level in all the patients first time coming to you mm. and the you are yeah. diagnosing the patient is high blood pressure so how many of you are using electrolytes as a tool to get a uh, yes sir in the history hypertension we do everything to diagnose no, it's it's any, any, any routine patients potassium ah uh, resistant any, hypertension oh routine so routine all the patients uh, we don't you are not doing electrolyte uh, levels in in this uh, hypertension patients we, we used to check renal function tests in each and every hypertensive patient 
because we need to rule out the secondary cause of hypertension we need to see the creatinine levels before starting ace inhibitors or arb so along with that i usually prefer uh, checking the electrolyte levels also See, uh, I tell you the one thing. I think all the patients got a hypertension, so there is a panel of tests we should do in all the patients. Yes. Generally, yes, we use an echo as an uh, a panel test for the evaluation of hypertension. I think echo is not recommended uh, to evaluate hypertension patients. The basic test we should do in a, any hypertension patients. Uh, first thing is hemoglobin, then second thing is electrolytes, then creatinine, and then the TSS levels. And other comorbid conditions like diabetes and uh, thyroid levels. These are things the basic test uh, you should do in all the hypertension patients. Uh, any any patient, young patients, old patients, any patients, and you will surprisingly find uh, around I think out of uh, maybe around one or uh, I will say thousand patients at least you will get one or two patients of Crohn syndrome or some of this uh, secondary hyperaldosteronism. Uh, these patients, my clinic practitioner, find it out. That's why I'm saying that we should make a very Routine clinical practice to use electrolytes as a uh, panel test for this evaluation of hypertension. So, in such patients, aldosterone antagonists uh, do remarkable things for the patients actually, and we can find out some uh, like uh, on syndrome, some adrenal adenoma, and if we correct uh, these, uh, we can we can do some surgeries for these adrenal adenoma patients. Then uh, the hypertension will go off. The patient will not uh, will not need so many hypertensive. The patient will be stabilized with one drug only. So I have some patients uh, uh, with this. Uh, just somebody was uh, uh, did a angioplasty. The patients came back to me with the not getting control blood pressures, and I've seen they were doing electrolytes in every visit, but they were not checking its potassium. They were just seeing and they let it go. So I have two or three patients uh, with the Crohn syndrome. I've I've seen in my clinic practice till now uh, with just a uh, with the low potassium levels. So I think we should make a. Uh, Practically, I'm going to just make a important uh, investigation in evaluation of this hypertension, uh, this electrolyte. Yes, sir. We are also doing uh, electrolyte level as a routine test in each and every newly diagnosed and they have <coughs> hypertension patient. One more thing I want to add. I also do the electrocardiogram instead of 2D echo to see the cardiac effect of the correct hypertension patient. Yes. Is all the patients should receive a base run ECG to whether the patients because somebody got a ECG evidence of uh, uh, left ventricular hypertrophy in terms of hypertension, then uh, these ARBs have a definitely mortality benefits over the other antihypertensive drugs. If there's no in, no evidence of uh, left ventricular hypertrophy in ECG, then we can use any class of drugs. Uh, uh, just we have to control the uh, good control of blood pressures. But somebody got a left ventricular hypertrophy in e on ECG. Then uh, this ARB, specifically this losartan, have a definite shown some mortality benefit in such patients. The definite trials was there with this left ventricular hypertrophy patients. We use uh, losartan, uh, some mortality benefit was there. Okay. So I think the last question we'll leave it to our CIPLA fellows. So, what are the some scientific initiatives we can take to increase the awareness among our clinical physicians? So, over to you, Naram. Hello. Yes, sir. Sir, actually, may we give what type of things we have to do in our day to day practice so that the number of heart failure patients we can improve the quality of life. So, I think what type of things we have to convey message to our company. Like, these are the things we have to do for heart failure patients. We can organize such uh, this, uh, then this meetings uh, more frequently. We can talk about our day-to-day -day clinical cases, uh, what are the difficulties uh, we are encountering in the managing these heart failure patients. Just as a uh, this, uh, physician point of view, I'm not talking of, uh, in terms of interventional cardiology. Point of view, just a physician point of view, we can discuss because uh, generally, as a physician, you have to manage so many patients, uh, you have to manage all the patients like diabetic, uh, hypertensive, infectious. So, generally, this uh, high heart failure management will be around, I think, out of your clinical practice, only five or maybe 10 percent of the total your clinical practice will be heart failure. So, we can guide you in a because uh, in, if I talk about my clinical practice. Uh, 
So maybe around 30 to 40 percent of the patients uh, will be heart failure patients, which only managing in our OPDs. So most of them will be non-ischemic patients specifically. So these patients also, I think, can be managed uh, at a small city level with a good physician. So in, in such uh, things, we can guide uh, in which patient we should use, which drug, and how many do how, how much dose we should use, and. Uh, how to use uh, this anti newer heart failure medications. Like I don't think so, most of the physicians now use this dapagliflozin or uh, uh, this ampagliflozin as an heart failure medications. You know that this ampagliflozin or dapagliflozin we can use as an heart, anti heart failure drug, even in non-diabetic patients also. So generally they will not lower down the uh, blood glucose levels if the patient is not diabetic. They definitely uh, decrease the symptoms. They will definitely improve the mortalities. In both the groups, whether it's a reduced reject infection or whether it's a fissured reject infection, in the both the groups, they have shown mortality benefits. After I think uh, after 20 years of uh, the last drug, which have shown some mortality benefit in diastolic heart failure patients was aldosterone antagonist. After that, only this mineral got this uh, azure inhibitors have shown to some mortality benefits. Otherwise, there were no mortality benefit with beta blockers. They no mortality benefit with ACE inhibitors or ARBs in diastolic heart failure patients. So, such discussion also we can carry out. I want to ask a question to Dr. Parvin. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, there are two types of heart failure. One is heart failure with reduced injection pressure, and second okay. is with reduced injection pressure. In clinical practice, when we say that this is the patient of heart failure with reduced injection pressure. Basically, in clinical practice, we say this is the patient of heart failure with normal echo, normal system system. Uh, I will tell you, in, in, for just for your clinical practice, see, when the in age increases, the incidence of systolic heart failure will come down rather than having a normal system infection. So, the diastolic heart failure will be much more common in the patient, the patient's age increases. Specifically, in the this, uh, four or five things you kept, kept in your mind, like elderly female. Obese females, diabetic females, these patients are very uh, notorious for having this uh, diastolic heart failure patient, diastolic heart failure. It's very, very common, especially in our, in our Indian setting, elderly, obese, and diabetic. If these three combinations is there, definitely there will be more chances of uh, diastolic heart failure rather than a systolic heart failure. So after 70, uh, these elderly females will have a very common, if you say, Somebody coming with a distant adjacent like class two, class three, elderly, obese females. If you add some diuretics, then they will have some remarked, remarkable uh, symptom improvement uh, in terms of dyspnea. You can add just a, an empirical basis. If you are not able to do an eco, and if the eco facility is not very easily available to you, somebody elderly female, obese, obese female comes to you with a uh, heart failure symptoms, then you can start straight away, start some loop paradigms, and then you see the difference. It's very common, very, very common. Uh, more commoner than this uh, reduced reject infection. Most of the females in the age group of uh, 60 to 70 who are yeah. obese and who are diabetic and hypertension and hypothyroidism, they always complain of dyspnea on minimal exertion. So it is a heart failure with preserved reject infection. Yeah, definitely. These pain will have uh, remarkable improvement with yeah. just adding some low dose diuretics will be enough. So we do echo for each and every patient. So yeah. their systolic functions are preserved and they have diastolic dysfunction. Yeah, new guidelines are there. I think if you're uh, aware about uh, earlier, we used to have some grade one, grade two, grade three diastolic function, but now we are not talking about this grade one, grade two, grade three. We just talk about if there three criteria are there with the normal EF, like if the left atrium size is increased, if the E prime E by E prime ratio is more than 10, and the patient is having some uh, mild pH in terms of like VA systolic pressure is more than 40, then if the three criteria are there on the eco, PA systolic pressure is more than 40, left atrium is enlarged, or left uh, atrium is uh, volume is increased. Mm -hmm. And if E by E prime is more than 10, then uh, yeah. you can straight and start with some, uh, we can diagnose this patient with a diastolic heart failure. And you can start some uh, loop diuretics with some uh, this mineral record receptor antagonist plus azulate inhibitors. You can start these two drugs in such patients. 
after having good control of diabetes, a good control of blood pressures, and good control of other uh, correctable things like uh, thyroid levels or uh, some weight reduction and uh, salt restriction, like these things, uh, you can add some diuretic also. Thank you, sir. Any other questions uh, you want to ask? Any other questions? Yeah. Sir, any sir? Only is, any it's nine thirty. I think now everybody is getting yeah. late for dinner, now. Yeah. 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 I yeah, took thank, a lot thank. of time. <laughs> Yeah, thank, thank you very much to Dr. Pravin, sir. And yeah, yeah. Nice yes, thank talk. you, I think. Uh, thank, thank you, everybody. You, thank you, Dr. Mukesh, Dr. Nathis, uh, Dr. Rupesh, and Dr. Ankur, uh, Dr. Tripa, and Dr. Vijayendra. So, thank you. Such a nice, nice, nice meeting. Session. Nice interactive. interactive. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Nice. Thank you. Sir, any, nice. sir, any other topic you want to suggest in future, we can plan system meetings. Uh, we can talk. Uh, they, just now we talked about this diastolic heart failure, no? Yeah, so we can yeah. talk about the topic called diastolic artery in next in next session also. Yeah. But then we need to include the echo part of the thing. Then uh, we can definitely teach you uh, in terms of echo. We'll talk over some simple things. Yeah. Just not very complex echoes. Just we'll talk over simple points which can uh, you can use in your day-to-day -day clinical practice. Easily you can differentiate between diastolic art failure between you say some section art failure. Or we can present some interesting echocardiography cases. Yeah, we can present it. Your I'm not sure whether how many of you uh, can uh, interpret and uh, all, all, all those things also. Yeah. Thank, thank, thanks, thanks a lot. Thank you, Mahendra. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, good night, I think. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, good night. Thanks a lot, sir. Oh, good. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night, sir.